So this is just kind of a general review of everything we've done this quarter, review for the unit test. I would recommend writing this down and then using this to make your study card. Your study card, you get an index card, front side, back side, write small, write down what you need to know. Uh, one of the first things we studied this year was layers of the atmosphere. Over here I have climate zones. Um, this morning when we did it, we didn't have time to go over this as well. The climate zones, there is a flipped lesson that reminds you how to make the climate book, which some of you uh, didn't finish. But that flipped lesson for the climate book actually briefly goes through each one of the climate zones. So if you're not sure about that, watch that flipped lesson. We just, um, we just checked out how to go over Edmodo for that. So then layers of the atmosphere. The very first thing, um, one of the first things we studied in weather was the atmosphere. You do need to know all the layers of the atmosphere from, and this is listing them from lowest to highest, and um, something about what happens in each layer. So you've got the troposphere. The troposphere is where everything happens. It's where the vast majority of the water, the oxygen, the carbon dioxide, all that's there. Something like 90% of the density of the atmosphere is in the troposphere. It's closest to Earth. All weather happens there. Almost all clouds, airplanes, life, all that's happening in the troposphere. Okay? You should have this information on your various quizzes and notes and stuff, so hopefully you're not trying to write every single little thing down. But that is the stratosphere. Stratosphere contains the ozone layer. The ozone layer protects us from many of the uh, harmful rays of the sun, like UV rays. There is a hole in the ozone layer that was caused by chemical reactions to some of the pollution we put in the air. One thing you don't hear about very often, though, is that the hole in the ozone layer um, will actually heal itself. It will close itself back up once we stop making those uh, pollutants, which for the most part we have. There's chemicals called CFCs, chlorofluorocarbons, that, um, that we used to produce a lot of. They're found in like aerosol cans. Um, McDonald's used to have all of their sandwiches, everything were in these styrofoam boxes. Producing styrofoam boxes put a ton of these chemicals in the air, and McDonald's went back to wrapping their sandwiches in paper. Uh, but things like that, there's been a lot of changes in that, and I believe they can see that the, the ozone layer is actually becoming smaller again because we've stopped making the chemicals, and so then the chemical reactions start replacing the ozone layer. Uh, the mesosphere, meso means middle. Mesosphere is the middle layer. Meteorites burn up. It's also the coldest layer. So meso, middle, meteorites. That's how you remember that. Um, and then the thermosphere. Thermos means hot. It's not hot if you're hanging out up there in the thermosphere, but it's very thin. There are not very many molecules. Those molecules have a ton of energy from the radiation from the sun. Uh, the thermosphere itself is made up of two layers, the ionosphere, and ion is a charged particle. Um, and those charged particles, as they trap the energy from the sun, you see the aurora. The exosphere is, is kind of a layer. Basically, it goes from a noticeable layer of atmosphere and fading out into um, space. In the exosphere, we also find such things as um, satellites, uh, the space station. And so that's all kind of going at the, uh, at the outer part of Earth's atmosphere. So that's the brief list of that. Again, you will definitely see that on the unit test. Questions about the atmosphere? Excellent. Next. Um, air masses. This is a lesson that we did in class um, about air masses. And you did it, you read it, you did a worksheet. We talked about it some, but not a tremendous amount. But it, you've seen it on several quizzes, so people, I think, have a pretty good idea of this. Um, air masses, and air mass is just a big volume of air, characterized by a certain temperature and a certain type of moisture. Now, this is really pretty easy because it can either be hot or cold. It can either be wet or dry. And what type of air mass it is depends on where it forms. I think everyone got a pretty good sense of this as we studied it. But basically, um, tropical, 
is a warm air mass. Polar is a cold air mass. Pretty easy. If it forms over land, it's continental. It's relatively dry. If it forms over the water, over the ocean, it's maritime. And it's relatively um, wet or high humidity. Uh, we talked about air masses first because as air masses run into each other uh, and move from one place to another, that's where we get a lot of our weather systems. Uh, you might remember that when a polar continental air mass meets up with a tropical maritime air mass, what happens sometimes? Tornadoes, stationary front, um, things like that. But in, in severe cases where the air masses are very different, you can get things like tornadoes. All right, questions on air masses? Types of clouds. This one we went over. We read it. We drew it. We went out. We looked at the sky. And still a week later, a lot of people, I thought, um, were struggling with this a little bit. So you need to make sure you know the three types of clouds. It's easiest, I think, if you just remember the three basic types. And then you can, um, from there, hang on, my pens keep disappearing. Once you've got those three basic types, you can um, talk about different types after that. So you've got cumulus, stratus, and cirrus. Who could tell me about cumulus clouds? Yes. Nope. <laughs> cumulus clouds. Big fluffy clouds. So cumulus clouds, when you think of the nice, you know, since you're like in kindergarten, you draw clouds like this. Yep, that's your basic cumulus cloud. They're fluffy. They're generally associated with, um, you know, kind of sunny summer weather or fair weather. Cumulus clouds. Uh, what's a stratus cloud? Okay. Stratus clouds are going to be the flat layered clouds. Um, is mostly what we have today. Flat layered clouds, oftentimes associated with fog, with the whole sky being overcast. These are relatively low clouds usually. And then finally, you've got cirrus clouds. And what do you know about cirrus clouds? Okay, good. So they're high altitude. They're very kind of feathery or stringy. Usually it means the wind is blowing and the weather is changing. Somebody first period said, you just have to remember the three Fs. They're fluffy or flat or feathery. I don't know how you remember which is which. I, I said the cirrus clouds you can remember because those two Rs look kind of like cirrus clouds. Yeah. All right. Then when you're talking about clouds, if you put the word nimbus next to a cloud, oops, <laughs> if you put the word nimbus next to a cloud, kind of funny, um, nimbus means stormy or rainy. So nimbus, you have cumulonimbus is these summer storms. If you have nimbostratus, then you've got um, like the clouds in a stationary front that you have long-term rain and snowstorms. And those are the main ones we're going to look at that you'll need to know. Everybody good with that? This next page has more stuff on clouds. So don't panic. And remember, you can always rewatch this lesson. Here's our three types of clouds again. The high, wispy, wind-blown clouds, which are cirrus, associated with the weather changing. The stratus clouds, which are the um, low layered clouds, stormy and foggy and rainy. And the cumulus clouds, kind of a mid altitude, and they're fluffy and um, generally happen with fair weather. All good? Okay. I'm not going to spend too much time on these because you can rewatch it. All of this stuff is stuff you've had in quizzes, notes, textbook, stuff like that. Okay, next on our list. Whoops. 
a little more about clouds. This is uh, the kind of anvil-shaped cumulonimbus cloud. We get these very tall clouds here in the summer sometimes with our summer storms. And what happens, they start at a lower altitude. You've got the warmer air here meeting up with cooler air. This air rises and causes an updraft. As the, sep as the cloud separates and get really, really tall, it actually separates so you've got negative charges up here and positive charges down here. And then you get lightning. You also, because the wind circulating in the cloud, the moisture will come here, get stuck in the updraft, go up here where it's really cold and freeze, and then come down, melt a little, come up here and freeze, and you end up with hail because it freezes layers and layers and layers. Um, but these are what we get with our big summer storms. And it's kind of nice because where we are here, we get to watch those forming sometimes over places further east. Uh, they call this an anvil-shaped cloud, you know, kind of uh, the roadrunner and coyote. You know, coyote just gets the anvil and drops it on himself, ultimately. But anvil, yes. You do sometimes get tornadoes from this, too. Um, because you, you've got the colder air and the warmer air, and then you get the rotation. That's just another picture showing um, lightning, cumulonimbus, and thunderstorms. Okay? Let's see what we got next. Next, um, moving into, let's do the heat transfer next. I think the next one. So heat transfer, remember our three types of heat transfer, which are going to end up with the greenhouse effect. We've got conduction, convection, and radiation. You've seen these terms over and over again since you were in the sixth grade. Uh, but three types of three types of heat transfer. Radiation travels through empty space. Radiation is often seen as light or something like that. Uh, and the radiation can go out in all directions. A hot stove burner radiates heat. You can feel the heat on the sides and such. Conduction can only happen if the two things are touching and the heat goes from the hotter object to the cooler object. Convection only happens in gases and liquids, and that's where you get convection currents from um, the area that gets warmest first, becomes less dense, rises, cools off, and then falls, and you get convection currents, which ultimately cause wind um, and mixing of ocean currents and things like that. This picture, and I have another one kind of similar to this, all weather on Earth ultimately caused by the sun. Um, of course, that's heat transfer by radiation coming from the sun. And the sun obviously travels through empty space. It's going to heat up the ground. So the ground gets hot. Uh, darker areas get hotter first. The air is touching the ground. So the air that, that's close to the ground gets warm first and starts to rise. Then you get convection currents. Um, wind patterns and things like that are simply uneven heating in the atmosphere. And I know we did those pictures in some other notes too. I think this one, this one, again, the greenhouse effect is as some of that heat gets trapped. Um, and this diagram from the textbook tells you what's happening up with all of the um, radiation coming from the sun. This week, as we talked about climate change, um, when you have more greenhouse gases, you get more heat trapped. If you have more clouds and stuff in the air, you're going to have less radiation coming through. And again, that's in the textbook and it's in one of our other lessons um, for the types of heat transfer. All right. Then, weather forecasting. This is something that we've come back to again and again. And I think really most of you are finally getting it. The quiz we took last week, most people did um, did do pretty well on that. Did I hand that pick quiz back to you? I did not. Um, so you do need to know the types of fronts. Your things are stuck in there. There you go. I'll close that for everybody. Okay. Um, so types of fronts. However, many of you are still messing up the cold fronts and the warm fronts. What does a warm front look like? 
It's got the rounded things on it, okay? Remember, because it's round and warm. What direction is this warm front moving? Moving the way the bumps are pointing. And then a cold front, cold fronts are spiky and cold, like icicles, somebody said. Now, if it's in color, warm fronts are red and the cold fronts are blue. But of course, unfortunately, you can't do color printing for anything, so you need to remember this. Um, and on the test, I know the weather thing I had on that last quiz, you couldn't see the resolution on some of it. On the test, in addition to having it printed there, I'll have it up here on the smart board uh, so you'll be able to see that as well. But you, you can count on having a question on the unit test very much like the one on the quiz you just took. So that's a warm front and a cold front showing you which, which direction they're moving. Uh, how about a stationary front? What's it look like? Excellent. And what direction is it moving? It's not moving. Tricky question. I asked you on the quiz which direction the stationary front was moving, and many of you said it was moving, but it's not. And some of you said it's stationary. Yes. So a stationary front looks like exactly what's happening. You've got your cold front and your warm front going in opposite directions. And again, nice if we're able to color it and see, but it is stalled because these two things are going in different directions ran in, into each other and are stuck there. What type of weather do you usually get with a stationary front? Usually get stormy weather. Uh, then we have the occluded front, which um, the weather you get with an occluded front is similar to what you get with the stationary front, but the way it's formed is a little bit different. And um, if you are lucky enough to get it in color, for some reason they make the occluded fronts um, this fabulous color, oops, whoa, of magenta. And so the occluded front looks like the warm front and the cold front kind of going the same way, but on top of each other. Because of what you'll see, I have a picture of it too. But basically you have three fronts that ran into each other. Uh, like two cold fronts with a warm front on top of it. Again, stormy weather, not moving, and that's the occluded front. Occluded means blocked or obscured. All right, types of fronts. And um, as mentioned, you should definitely practice your map reading skills because, hang on, I think it's actually on the next, We'll come back to that in just a second. Um, practice your map reading skills because it is useful. And you can look at things like this. Um, and again, usually I draw these in here for you a little bit. We know the weather here. It's supposed to be rainy um, all week. And you can, in fact, see that little stationary front here. Almost looks like two different stationary fronts. You've got rain showing. Um, here, and high pressure out here. So make sure you can look at these and identify these various things that we've talked about quite a bit over time. Um, another thing you might want to do to study, this, web, this website is weather.gov, as you see up here. You can do weather.com. There's a lot more advertisements and not as many good maps. But from here, you can plug in... Um, the zip code and get your detailed forecast. Again, it might be a good thing to practice if you want to look at these sorts of things. So let's get rid of this. When you go here, then you can look at some of these other maps. There's our forecast, our rain. And when you click on this, I like these because then you can actually see, you can literally see where the moisture is, where the fronts are. Um, you can look at this first and then kind of work backwards and say what kind of fronts are where. So lots of good stuff, satellite imagery and that to help you with that. Questions about weather forecasting? Awesome. Okay, 
So a couple of pictures to go along with this. Uh, land breeze and sea breeze. I'm not going to go over these in detail now, but you probably remember these. We've gone over these a lot. And I think it's a really useful example, even though we don't live near the ocean, um, and so it's not something we experience on a daily basis, being able to explain and draw and understand the land breeze and sea breeze helps you understand radiation from the sun, conduction, convection, uneven heating, wind patterns that, tra that change throughout the day, all of that stuff. If you can understand and explain land breeze and sea breeze, you got all of that. And yes, you'll probably see land breeze and sea breeze on the unit test. Next, oh, what kind of front do you think that is? Could be a stationary front or it could be cold front. This front is pushing away the other one. Um, but yeah, it could be either one, cold front or stationary front. You've got rain happening, precipitation happening right where they meet. And then, as we know, with the cold fronts, they move through pretty quickly, being pushed through. Uh, let's see what we got here. It's a diagram of a cold front. That's what the occluded front is going to look like. So, again, it's trapped because one front is on top of the other fronts. So, you probably had like a cold front moving through here, and then another cold front smashed into it. Oops. Um, here we have this diagram, which should look familiar to you. What's this diagram showing? Rain shadow. Um, when we talk about climate, what kind of things are being demonstrated by this picture in terms of climate? Mountains, which affect precipitation. So mountains, uh, mountain ranges, and uh, prevailing winds are going to affect which areas get uh, different precipitation. Because these two areas, if you look um here and here the climate might be different they're obviously the same latitude the same altitude the same distance from large bodies of water but because of the prevailing winds going this way and the presence of mountains you're going to have different climates because of the amount of rainfall so that's a picture we uh we see over and over and again you guys are getting pretty good at labeling that this is one that we see here in colorado quite often um, and then these are just the climate zones. Again, um, if you want more information on the climate zones, you can look at that. I'm not going to go through all of these. Uh, that the first one's this one's uh, precipitation, temperature. Those things together make climate. Here are the global wind bands. Uh, we talk about global wind currents as opposed to local winds. And what's causing these winds here? Two major factors causing the winds here. Rotation of the Earth is causing them to go this way and this way. That's called the Coriolis effect. Um, where is it high pressure and where is it low pressure? Low pressure at the equator. Why? Because it's hot. The sun shines most directly here. And so that rises, making um, low pressure, cold air at the poles. Um, so the air is falling, making high pressure. Did I say that backwards? Low pressure, high pressure. And then there's a band in between because the air cells just aren't that big. Uh, when we talked about yesterday, um, we watched the things on climate change. And uh, what did they talk about yesterday relating to this picture and global warming and changing climates and, yeah. The jet stream. The jet stream is a prevailing wind, uh, a global wind pattern, and it generally goes through here, right? These are the prevailing westerlies. And the jet stream comes in and kind of goes like this. And how high or low it is depends on what season it is and various other things. Now, what was the factor they said that was affecting the, our jet stream? Yeah, the poles. So if the global temperature is a little warmer, the poles are a little warmer. And so you're not getting as much high pressure at the poles, which is causing the jet stream to be a little bit different, which is causing our weather patterns to be different, which is causing things like Hurricane Sandy coming up and hitting New York instead of being um, pushed out into the Atlantic as it normally would be.
And I think that is most of what we got here. That's the water cycle. We talked about that a long time ago. Water cycle won't be on the on the test. This your global wind, wind patterns again, um, caused by heating, direct sunlight, uh, the turning of the earth, naming these. I don't care as much about the names of them, but just understanding why they're happening. Uh, but it'd be good to review that. And that's it. There is the entire nine weeks in um, about, what, 16 minutes. Any questions? Ah, oh, 25 minutes. Any questions? 25 minutes. All right. I'll move this.